good. Moses, we've sinned. Now they repent. Okay, so now they enter this place of repentance. And they say, this is what we're repenting of. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. So please, please, as our leader, pray to the God because we know that the Lord, as the Bible says in one place, spoke to Moses mouth to mouth, uh, face to face. It actually translates as mouth to mouth. And um, he said, pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. Now, this is a really interesting piece of instruction. Because, you see, in one sense, here, here God is. He's created a plague and sent it against the nation of Israel. Now, God is saying, make an image of the plague which I have sent against the people of Israel. And then he says, put it on a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. Interesting. So Moses follows through. He makes a serpent of brass and puts it on a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So in other words, all God said is, you just got to look at this thing. Just look at it. Look to the serpent on the pole. Just look. To, and, and here's the question. Okay, here's the question. Why, why would God want people to look upon a serpent? Isn't the serpent in the Garden of Eden the reason why man fell in the first place? Isn't Leviathan like described as this? horrible dragon in the sea that's king over all the children of pride? Isn't the devil in the book of Revelation described as a dragon with seven heads and ten horns? Isn't this thing called the serpent a symbol of sin and death and the devil? Yes, it is. <laughs> so why would God want them to look to sin, to look to death? Well, here is where it makes sense. See, when Jesus went upon the cross, he became sin. Now, now, now this is real revelation for a lot of people. That Jesus, Jesus didn't just die for our sins. The Bible actually says... He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he, he made Jesus to be, be sin. This is incredible. So why did God tell them? Okay, and we're, we're going to come back to this point and make it a little bit stronger in a little bit. But, but the reason... They were looking to a type of Christ. In other words, Jesus, who had become sin on the cross, was typified in that brazen serpent put upon the pole idea. When you look to Jesus, your healing will come. Wow. Okay. Now, let's come back to this story. All right. Um, interesting that as the people are journeying, through the land, uh, uh, by the Red Sea, and they begin to complain. They complain about bread and water. Bread and water. Bread and water. This is significant. Okay? Why? Why is the bread and water that the people complain about significant? This is some more, you know, as we study the Bible, man, there's so many cool things that begin to come alive to us. And, and, Let's begin with a certain passage in the book of John chapter 4. Where Jesus meets a woman at a well. This is the story. The woman said to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. Right? So he's talking to this woman at the well. The woman 
has, they've already engaged in conversation. And, 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 and so then Jesus continues to explain this concept that he's getting at because she thinks he's talking about literal water when he's talking about something else entirely. Verse 14 picks up, it says this, But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him shall be in him a well of water springing up in everlasting life. And the interesting word about the, uh, life, the interesting thing about the word life, there is different kinds of life, the words translated as life in Greek, and, and the one that is associated with God is zoe. This is literally the life of God or the life that God enjoys. Now, the water that Jesus will give people will be, is intended to be in them a well of water springing up into eternal life of God. And many people write this off to a uh, time in the future when we're already dead and we get to live with God for eternity, which is true. But that everlasting life is dwelling on the inside of us now. This is why the Bible says in uh, the book of Ephesians, that we would be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That there is a strength that we can draw from our inner man where there has been put a well of water springing up into everlasting life. For God himself dwells within a believer. This is incredible. So what is he saying? See, the people are complaining because they had a lack of water. Now, let's take a spiritual lesson from this and say, wow, what is Jesus saying here? Now, Jesus is saying this, I'm going to give them living water. So what I've noticed is that people tend to complain a heck of a lot more when they've cut themselves off from living water, when they're drying up spiritually. Now, let's continue this uh, uh, kind of trend here. Um, the words of a man's mouth are as deep waters and a wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. Now, see, here we find that a man's words are like water. Interesting. Uh, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Uh, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present itself to, it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Well, why do you call it bride ministries, Daniel? Well, here, you know, you see Jesus who gave himself for, for, for what? A bride. And what did he call the bride? He called it the church. That, so, but here we have uh, a passage that declares to us that he washes us with water by the word. So see, here we have a correlation where Jesus coming to us as his word, his word in us springs up into everlasting life. Okay, this is why we need teaching based on the word of God. If we do not have the truth of God's word in us deep down inside, it cannot spring up into us everlasting Zoe, the very life of God. See, the very life of God is established in our experience according to our knowledge and integration into the promises of his word. Jesus in us, alive and springing up, is that well of water. And this is what these people, they were missing it. They were missing it. Many of us are missing it. We can't get healing because the, 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 the power of Christ's resurrection and the thing that he accomplished at Calvary to take our sicknesses to the cross is not springing up the life of God on the inside of us. As a matter of fact, it's not even there because no one told us. Or maybe it was told to us, but we didn't believe it. This is a problem. And we're going to get into in this uh, show tonight because we have two hours, and I just love that I could talk about this thing for two hours. Uh, we are going to get into the heart, because the heart is really where everything meets. And we're going to be coming back to the heart many times throughout this year, because the heart is a central revelation to, like, everything. And uh, this thing is just, we just got to get this. But there's another passage in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 3. It says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and in hewn 
them out histerns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, these people could not contain the revelation of God, his spirit, his move, his revelation. They, 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 they could not, and, and as many times, this is true for us as Christians too, we are leaking. Someone gives us the word of God. Be strong and courageous for God is with you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We're a broken sister and that word goes in one ear, right out the other, and we stay stuck in the same pit and ditch we've been in all this time. We stay sick. We stay broke. We stay broken. We stay poor and impoverished. We stay ineffective. And God is wanting to put his word on the inside of us. Jesus Christ literally springing up into our lives. Everlasting life. This is important. If we want healing in our lives, if we want access to the healing power of God, what we need to do is get his word, his water, on the inside of us and allow God to spring that up throughout every element of our being. Um, when our source of the word dries up or we become broken cisterns into which God can no longer pour his word, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. Right around the corner, uh, headaches and nonsense. All right. Now, they also complained about bread. Interesting. Jesus is the bread of life. <laughs> okay. So uh, the Bible says in, in John 6, 32 through 35, Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then, he, then, they, then said they, Unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Right? So, now, what are we talking about? We're talking about God. And we're talking about God's operations in us. What Jesus came to be for us. Now, we know also that not only does Jesus give us his word, he is the word himself. In the beginning, in, in the Bible, in John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the word. And the water is the word of God. Jesus comes to us as both a person and an utterance. He is the word of God and we are washed by the water of God's word. We dry up and go hungry when we are separated from the direct influence of Jesus in our lives due to schedules, lack of fellowship, a failing prayer life, and when we fail to read the word of God. And when we fail to allow God to upgrade our revelation of who he is and wants to be to us. It is easy to slide into confusion and complaining when we follow the path of lack of fellowship, of failing prayer life, failing to read the word of God, and busyness, committing our day to nonsense. Folks, we need to get out of this and we need to transition into faith. Many of you that are going to listen to this program need to be physically healed. You need it. Your body is broken. Uh, your spirit is broken. Your heart is broken. Your emotions. I mean, if, if we were able to take a microscope to your heart and look at all the wounds that speak to you on a daily basis, whether you acknowledge them or not, it might not be a pretty picture. God wants to heal that. Okay? Now, when Moses interceded for the people, God gave instruction to craft a serpent and put it on a pole, right? So he's saying, here, now let me show you my provision. You know, you, you haven't had the water, you haven't had the bread, um, and you're complaining about it, but now I'm going to show you the type. And he put the serpent on the pole. That serpent became a type of Christ. Because 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, for he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him at... 1 John 4.10 says herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation 
the sacrifice, the payment for our sins. Now, here's where we really meet the rub. Okay, if the serpent on the pole serves as a type of Christ, then how could we expect anything less than a source from the antitype, Jesus Christ himself? If the people in the wilderness looked to the serpent and were healed because that was a type of Christ. In other words, it was a reflection of what Jesus Christ would one day do and accomplish. Why would Jesus Christ do less than the type being the anti-type, being the very Redeemer himself? How... Uh, it is ludicrous to think that Jesus Christ is not a healer and that his atonement did not provide healing for us. Remember Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. In quoting this passage in the book of Matthew, we find the following. Okay, this is the counterpart. Matthew 8, 14 through 17. And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever, and he touched her hand. And the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, or the evening, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, and here is the quote, himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. In Ma Matthew, writing in Greek, uh, tr translating this, uh, from the original passage in Isaiah 53, 4, recognized the reality of what these words, griefs and sorrows, were really communicating. Infirmities and sicknesses, or sicknesses and diseases. Jesus died for that. And Jesus displayed the fact that he came to die for that, in that, in his ministry, he healed literally every single person that was brought to him. God is a healer. We need to embrace this. We need to know that going to Jesus is going to a source of healing, not to an angry, bitter, judgmental, envious person, hateful, uh, someone that wants us to suffer and be sick. You know, there's different kinds of suffering in the Bible. There is avoidable suffering and unavoidable suffering. We are going to suffer in this world if we follow Christ and, and we're going to suffer trials and tribulations and rejection. And, w you know, if, the, if they rejected Jesus, of course we're going to be rejected for uh, following Jesus. I, I mean, but there is avoidable suffering and unavoidable suffering. And frankly, some of us have so bonded with our sickness and disease and so received it that we are in the realm of avoidable suffering. If only we would turn our lives and our eyes on Jesus, on the cross, like the Israelites did in the wilderness. Look to the cross. We would be healed. And we would be taken out of that realm of avoidable suffering and into the realm of no suffering. In other words, deliverance, wholeness. This must happen for many people. And, 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 and I see this all the time. I mean, there are so many Christians that have been so trained to not believe God for the supernatural. It, it breaks my heart. That how we can believe God to supernaturally save us from our sins and put us in heaven with a death that occurred 2,000 years ago and not believe him to heal our cancer. I mean... The, the, the gap in logic that it takes to separate the ability of God in, in that profound of a way to say God will only do this but not that. I mean, it, it really takes 
a lot of work. It takes it, it, it actually takes training, um, which is unfortunate that some people, you know, but this is what happens. People, they'll, they'll, they'll see someone sick and they'll say, well, you know, maybe I'll try to pray for them. Let's see what happens. And they say, Lord, if it be your will, I pray that you would just heal this person that's sick. Now, the person that's praying has no faith. They don't even know if they're supposed to be praying the prayer that they're praying. The person that's being prayed for has no faith. They don't even know whether or not they have the right to believe God for the healing that someone is praying over them. Two people in unbelief praying for God to move. And they wonder why God does not move, yet they read the passage in the Bible that says Jesus could not do many great works in Nazareth because of their unbelief. And then they say, well, maybe God just wants you sick. Maybe God just, you know, and, and, and they get stuck there. People get stuck there, suffer through disease for years and years and years and years, chronic pain for years and years and years and years, and they never think, maybe I need to get some teaching on the inside of me that is going to be a well of life springing up the Word of God alive on me that I don't want to be a broken cistern anymore. I want to allow God to pour His water into me, to wash me with it, that I get to access the very life of God. Because that, that, that's what the Bible is actually saying here. We have to get beyond these objections. Because, I mean, the devil wants, the devil wants Christians to be poor and sick and broken and in the hospital on 25 different medications. That, that, of course, the devil, why does the devil want that? Satan wants that. Because when people are in that place, they are dependent on a system. They are ineffective. I mean, how much more effective is a person if they are bedridden or have a fully functional body that can take them into all the corners of the earth? Where are they most effective? I mean, we, we really need to get a perspective on this thing. God is a healer. And... Um, Let's, let's, let's move on, okay? The, the question, how do we get from being sick, okay, to being whole? If Jesus is really a healer, why hasn't he healed us yet? Why hasn't he healed you yet? Why hasn't he healed my friend yet? What stands between people and their access to divine healing, okay? So, Daniel, if you're telling us the truth, if you're telling us that God, he really did buy our healing with, with the death of Jesus, that, that actually paid for it. He took my sickness to the cross. Then what do I have to do to access that for my life? Because right now, I don't have it. Now, one of the elements that plays a huge role in this question is the role of the heart. The heart is a revelation that is central to everything. 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 So, um, first of all, what is the heart? When we talk about the heart in the Bible, we see that the heart is referenced throughout the Bible from the beginning to the end. We, we, we see the heart all the way through. God talking about the heart, looking upon the heart, judging the heart, um, all these different things happening. But, you know, then we say, well, that's interesting, you know, and, and we even talk about it in our own daily vernacular. You know, people use it in text messages. I heart you. What does that mean? I love you. Um, we, we always talk about, you know, you, well, you broke my heart. Um, th that deals in response, you know, it's not a literal understanding of, yeah, I, you literally went in my chest and cracked my organ in half and I'm bleeding to death right now. No, no, we understand that the heart is a reference to something else, even in our daily vernacular. But what is it? What is it? Is it an organ or is it something more? Of course it's something more. So in the Hebrew language, the word heart comes from the, from the word lab or, or lav and this means the inner man, mind, will, heart, or understanding. Um, and I'm pulling this off of blueletterbible.com, the Strong's Concordance in there. But just to give you some of the ideas of the definitions you're going to get, when you look this up, it's the inner part or midst. This is how it's understood. It's the midst of things, the heart of man, the soul or heart of man, mind, knowledge, thinking, reflection, memory, inclination, resolution, determination of will, conscience, heart of moral character, seat of appetite, seat of emotions and passions, a seat of courage. These are the different ways it's used in the Hebrew text. What is that? Okay, um, so that's the understanding of this in Hebrew. In, in Greek, we pick up with the word cardia. 
myocardia. Now, in the Greek, this is understood as an organ, yes, uh, which circulates blood. So it is also regarded as the seat of physical life, but also, and still continuing the revelation from the, from the Hebrew, it denotes the center of all physical and spiritual life. It's the vigor and sense of physical life. It's the center and seat of spiritual life. It's the soul or mind as it is the fountain and seat of thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, endeavors of the middle or central or innermost part of anything, even though inanimate. This is a heart. Um, I've touched on this on a few shows before. But I believe that the best single word to describe the heart as revealed by the Bible is... And are you ready for this? Ready? Okay. The best single word to describe the heart as revealed by the Bible is the subconscious. Subconscious. I believe firmly that the best single word used to describe the heart as revealed by the Bible is what psychologists in our current day vernacular have coined the subconscious. In other words, it is the underlying thought base out of which everything in our lives is governed. This is essential to understanding how to operate according to the supernatural. Okay? But before we go any deeper with this, we're going to look at some scriptures to talk about the activity of the heart. Because what I'm going to do, I am going to tie the activity of your heart to the message of God's healing power. Because this, this is what I believe. I believe that the heart as the subconscious contains all of our beliefs. It contains our thoughts that form there as belief systems. It's different than the conscious mind. It's different than the conscious mind or suki. Uh, because the, the conscious mind it has a lot of thoughts. It has a lot of thoughts. It's passed right through. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, I could look at a train, think train. I could look at a, a car, think car. I could look at a house, think house. All these things going through my mind, mind, mind. But none of them becomes an operating system on the inside of me. You know, when I go into a conversation and someone begins to yell at me, I don't think car, 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 and that's my belief system. No, that, that was just a passing thought. What I think is rejection, rejection, rejection. Now, now rejection is a belief system. This is a program. This is the kind of thought that gets rooted in the heart realm. It's a different thing. Uh, if, if rejection is rooted in the heart, what happens is when we go into a, 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 um, a situation where a person is you know, yelling at us or whatever, what we, what we take from that is rejection, rejection, rejection. All we, can, all we can process from that is this person is just rejecting me. I'm no good for anything but to get rejected. I should have expected this and this only. We actually expect, I mean, because why? W what it is, it's an underlying thought program. And this is what the heart, this is what the heart contains. And so in order to receive the healing power of God, what we have to do is get out of our heart realm. Not, not conscious mind. I don't care what you think while you're listening to me. What I care is what's in here after you get done listening to me. I don't care. Daniel, he was talking about healing and that sounded great and it made sense. That doesn't matter. I don't, I don't care about it. I've met too many Christians that have heard about healing, 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 and yet they don't have faith for healing. Why? Because they never got it out of their conscious mind and into their heart. When, it gets, when a message gets into a person's heart, it becomes them. So you want the message of God's healing to become you. Because when God's healing becomes you, then that word is springing up into everlasting life of God in you. But if it's not... And, and there's even a, another level to this because, uh, as I'll explain later, the, the heart really resides between the soul and the spirit, um, the, the pneuma. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so, you know, but, but suffice it to say on, on a simple, just a simple point, if we have the false belief systems in our heart, well, 
our life will be patterned after those belief systems. Now, where are you getting this, Daniel? Because you're saying an awful lot of stuff. And, you know, it kind of makes sense, but really, are you going to pull this from the Bible? And the answer is yes, I'm going to pull this from the Bible. In Proverbs 4.23, we find this. It says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Literally, uh, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are life, or flows life. Your life flows from your heart. Your life experience, everything that happens or manifests in your life is going to be uh, in some way directly or indirectly tied to your heart condition. There's a reason why salvation involves the heart. The Bible says, he that 